international role of the Euro. Thanks all of you for coming back after a long day to this uh, session four. It was mentioned many times this morning that uh, today the Euro is the currency of 19 countries with over 340 million citizens. It's the second most important currency in the world. And in this session, we would like to look deeper into the role the Euro has played on the international scale and its future role as an international currency. Of course, when discussing a topic like the one of this conference, 20 years of the Euro, the past and the future, it's unavoidable to uh, discuss this international role. The international role of the Euro, ladies and gentlemen, is closely linked to the role of the European economy in the world. And a wider global use of the Euro can, for instance, lower trading costs for European businesses. It can become more attractive as a store of value and thus lead to decreased interest rates paid by European households, firms and governments. And it stabilizes the access of uh, European businesses in uh, to finance in turbulent times and makes the European economy less vulnerable to exchange rate shocks. So it's quite li clearly a very important uh, topic, this international role of the Euro for us Europeans as a community, as an economy. And uh, as everything in, in life, things come in a package and uh, all these advantages have also risks and responsibilities. It has consequences for central bank mandates, the balance of payment issues and other policy fields. And clearly, if we discuss the international role of the euro today, uh, we must think in trade-offs, weighting benefits, an increased international role of the euro would have against potential risks and the costs that come with an increased global responsibility. And I'm therefore very happy that we could convince two really outstanding speakers to come to our conference to discuss this with us, these complex topics, both with a deep and long experience in questions of international macroeconomics and international currencies. So let me please introduce two speakers to you. So we have first Mrs. Kerstin Jorner. She is since 2016 the deputy Director General in the Directorate General of Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission. She has a very long and deep professional experience in working for European institutions. She was a Director for Single Market Policy Regulation and Implementation from June to December 2015 and Director of Intellectual Property. She served in many cabinets, such as the Cabinet of Commissioner Barnier, Internal Markets and Financial Services, Vice President Barrault, Justice and Home Affairs, Commissioner Barrault, Transport, Commissioner Verheugen, Enlargement, and so on and so on. The list is very long. She was also on the negotiating team of the Nice Treaty. And Kerstin Jorda holds degrees in law from Bonn and Hamburg and a diploma in advanced European studies. The second speaker is Arnaud Mehl. Arnaud is a Principal Economist in the Directorate General International of the European Central Bank, ECB, where he works on issues related to the international monetary system, global policy coordination, spillovers, and many international issues. And uh, he is also behind the ECB report of the international role of the euro, which was also mentioned this morning, I think, various times. And if you go through the literature on international economics and the academic literature, you will immediately come across the many contributions Arnaud has made to this field. I'm very happy that you both accepted to join us here. And we will have now two presentations by our guests. We start with Kerstin Jorner and then go on to Arnaud's presentation. And I will make sure that we have also enough time for questions. We have a slot until 5.30 where we have to end quite sharply because then afterwards the whole room is like rearranged for the dinner that will be on later in the evening. So without out much further ado, let me ask Kerstin to take the floor 
and give us her presentation from startup to scale up the global role of the euro. Kerstin, please. Thank you very much. You will see that I can only barely hide my origins, like Lutka, uh, from innovation policy. Um, great powers have great currencies. I quote Robert Mundell, Nobel Prize laureate. The EU is a great power. Much has already been said today. Uh, 16, almost 17 percent of uh, global GDP, top trading partner with 80 countries. Um, third largest population after China and India, very stable business environment. The euro, and we have about heard that today as well, is a great currency. 19 countries and followed by 60 countries globally around the world. Um, it has become a reserve currency, an invoicing currency, and an issuing currency, and all of this in the first 20 years. You've mentioned the benefits it brings to citizens and companies. And um, uh, of course, it's also correct to acknowledge that in the financial crisis, uh, which shook the world, uh, it, it affected the attractiveness of the euro. But since that time, we've built new, uh, a new architecture and new institutions. So essentially, my question today is, is the euro great enough? So I was saying, is the euro great enough? And the answer is not yet, uh, because we can observe that currently. If the euro had a bigger role, we would not be in this conundrum uh, of dependence on the dollar. Uh, it would mean a reduced ability of the United States to pursue their political objectives, which are inconsistent, sometimes, Iran, with the European Union objectives. Um, but we can, you know, you could imagine other examples of the same. Um, this being said, we believe that the fact that the euro will be playing a bigger role on, uh, in the global scene is not a question of if, it's a question of when. Strengthening the euro position will have a positive impact not only for the euro area countries or for the EU member states and their citizens, but also globally bringing financial stability worldwide and offering stakeholders more choices. I want us to put on the inventor lenses for a moment and look at the euro from the perspective of a startup. Any invention starts with a great idea. We can thank François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl and many others for that. Then the idea needs capital. In our case, it needed political capital in order to go from proof of concept to market introduction. In the case of the euro, this meant agreement between the member countries. It meant building the institutions and creating the regulatory environment. As we've heard throughout today, that was a success. The first 20 years overall were a success and we managed to get through one of the most serious crises we probably would not have imagined at the stage. Now the question is whether the inventors of the euro were thinking about the global role of the euro. And there are many in the room who were there, so I, I uh, please forgive if I maybe interpret things uh, not totally correctly. But to my mind, the answer is no, they did not think about that. At the time of the creation of the single currency, the internationalization was not a priority because there was a very strong multilateral rules-based trade system in the early 2000s. European leaders considered that promoting the international role of the euro was not a necessary condition to foster European economic growth and trade because it was happening anyhow. But that picture has changed dramatically. EU economy was hit by the financial and sovereign crisis which was triggered in the US but had a global impact. New forms of technological domination are appearing. The rules-based multilateral system is under challenge. Probably by the end of this year, we will no longer have an appellate uh, body at the WTO because no new judges will have been appointed uh, due to US block blocking it. New economic powers are emerging. 
and the US, as I mentioned before, handle extraterritorial um, unilateral actions. The world order is shifting from a US-dominated multilateral system towards a multipolar world in which Europe needs to define its new role. This means also revisiting the Euro issue. It's time for the Euro to move from the startup phase to the scale-up phase. This means zooming in on how to increase the international role and how to give it global impact. Now, how do you take a successful product from startup to scale up. Let's put the inventor lenses again. Scaling up a successful product means working on your suppliers to do more. It means understanding how to engage your customers in a broader way. It means expanding your distribution channels. It means improving your after sales servicing, but above all, it means finding the right capital. Let us look at each of these five in relation to the euro. Suppliers. Here we mean all those who bring the euro-denominated products to the market. Those are issuers, public and private, but also any operator who makes its transaction in euros, including in the financial markets. Sovereign debt issuance, of course, stands out. ECB data show that on average 98% of outstanding government debt securities of Euro area members is denominated in Euro. But there are also differences between Euro area countries to be observed. They range from 100% for some to 69%. Unsurprisingly, the same data show much lower Euro issuance in the not yet in Euro area countries. As you know, the Euro is the currency for all member states, eventually. Here, the average is 22% of euro-denominated issuance. And some countries, like the UK or Denmark, do not issue euro-denominated uh, government debt at all. Customers. The customers of the euro use the euro for payment settlement, holding reserves, or to denominate their debt. Despite the euro's relatively wide use of international payments, less than 60% of euro areas export outside the EU are actually invoiced in euro. This is in stark contrast with the US, where we have 90% of US exports denominated in dollars. Um, encouraging issuance in euro, along with promoting it as an invoicing currency, is therefore important. I note, en passant, that European organizations owned by the euro member states have a slightly less good record uh, than their shareholders. EID and EUDRD issue 34% and 50% of their debt in US dollar in 2018. Some markets such as energy, transportation, aircraft in particular, and commodities are subject to very strong US dollar dominance, sometimes for mainly historical reasons. Tackling these uh, possible inefficiencies in specific sectors could improve euro liquidity. However, and this is based on the consultation exercises that we've just conducted, the example of the aircraft industry also shows the challenges and the limitations to foster an enhanced role of the euro. Our consultation, uh, uh, which was launched uh, three months ago and the results of which will be published uh, in June, uh, Companies shows that companies tend to accept the US dollar even when their cost base is actually in euros, and even if that implies difficult and costly hedging operations in order to sustain competitiveness. Add to this the fact that global supply chains that characterize the aircraft sector in particular are also dominated by US dollar. We have to conclude that inertia in these markets is a significant barrier to greater use of the euro. I turn to distribution channels. That these are the euro payment infrastructures and marketplaces. The recent European reforms of the clearing and settlement systems, as well as the instant payment system active since last year, have equipped the euro with the most safe, efficient, and open large payment infrastructure in the world. For the marketplace, the Capital Markets Union component is crucial, and we've heard that before as well today. 
the ease with which financial assets can be bought and sold is essential for the financial system to work properly and to support investment and economic growth. The liquidity of a currency is therefore a significant characteristic of a healthy distribution channel. And actually, there is increasing competition for the distribution channel. China, for example, is pushing countries along the Belt and Road Initiative to allow greater use of the renminbi, through, though countries are not always responding favorably. However, we have a first precedent. Uh, Pakistan agreed in its recent agreement with China to use the Chinese currency. And, you know, it's only a question of time when the US will also have the same ideas. Takes me to the fourth one, the after-sales servicing. Strengthening the international position of the euro will not be possible without strengthening the euro area from inside. This means completing both banking and monetary union. We've heard a lot about this today, and uh, I'll just go to the headlines. Deepening EMU, it's the confidence in the value of the euro is ensured and the predictability and credibility of our monetary policies. That's why it's important, European semester, reform support program to continue on, on these. Um, a robust institutional setup is also essential to, for the confidence of investors and users. And, uh, and deep and broad financial markets are uh, relevant for the liquidity. So we have to con continue those reforms. And that takes me to my fifth point, capital. The alpha and omega for any inventor seeking to scale up. For the euro, we're talking about political capital and trust capital. How do we build the convincing pitch? The euro has very strong arguments. Article 63 of the EU treaty prohibits all restrictions on capital movement and payments, not only within the EU, but also between EU countries and countries outside the EU. This is a quasi-constitutional guarantee. The rule of law provides assurance for businesses uh, autonomy and capital flows. I already mentioned the size and the economic weight of the euro area. Reforms on banking union and deepening monetary union are being undertaken. Two not yet in countries, who were also mentioned today as already, uh, have signaled their intention to join the euro and they are actively preparing to get ready. Uh, we're talking about Bulgaria and Croatia here. The debates on deepening EMU, which were hitherto very much confined to finance ministries and finance ministers and central banks, have reached foreign ministries and chancelleries. Um, this means also more political capital. All of this will not remain without impact on market participants, and that's the trust capital. Ladies and gentlemen, the glass is half full as we enter the new political cycle in Europe. You know, in two weeks we have European Parliament elections. So, what are the next steps? Let me finish by looking at the coming months. We had, I already mentioned, a, s a number of targeted consultations on energy, foreign exchange markets, aircraft, maritime and rail respectively. And we will pull all these uh, uh, results together uh, for June. Um, we're still in the middle of analyzing all of this, so I can only do a little curtain raiser um, today. First on foreign exchange, we had 61 respondents and they covered all the angles of the market. Um, and uh, they agree on one thing, which is liquidity. High liquidity, sufficient listing of currency pairs available, sufficient promotion of euro currency pairs by market makers. All of this they consider as key. However, and this is interesting because that's a disagreement between smaller and bigger players, they disagree on the cost of hedging, um, uh, with 45 saying that, percent saying that it's equal between the euro and the dollar, and uh, uh, almost the same amount of people saying it's more costly uh, for the euro. So we'll have to look more into this. Uh, what the responses also show is this dividing line between big corporations who can actually manage around the constraints and the smaller uh, um, companies who have more of a problem and where it's you know disproportionately costly for them um, without an international role for the euro. 
And if you remember that 98% of all European companies are SMEs, it gets into a picture. Now, so you see, we're in the, we are actually already in the middle of the next project on the euro for the next 20 years. The first 20 years were about starting up. Now it's the question of the scaling up. The debate we have on the euro only echoes the debate we have in Europe as a, that Europe as a whole will have to have. What is the place of Europe in the world? Will decisions about our companies, our citizens, our data, our governance be made in Washington and Beijing or in Europe? How do we protect and leverage our internal strength globally? Remember, we had quite a good sales pitch actually for the, cap for the political capital. In any event, in this debate, the euro is one of the crown jewels that Europe has. And I conclude, great economies have great currencies. Looking forward to discussing this with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Thanks for your excellent presentation on the challenging circumstances. <laughs> and the next speaker will be Arnaud Mail from the ECB. Arnaud, please. Thank you. <coughs> so I have some slides. If they could be uploaded, that would be great. So we are waiting for <coughs> more slides. Here they are. Oh, they're there. Yeah. Wonderful. So yeah, the technique yeah. works? Yeah. <laughs> so good omen. <coughs> okay. Well, thanks for. Thanks for having me uh, as the last speaker before dinner um, in this great conference, which I enjoy very much. Um, actually, 20 years ago, the Euro was created, but as I was telling Martin, uh, 20 years ago, I also lived in Vienna, so I come every 20 years. So I hope that you'll invite me in 20 years' time again. Uh, that will be particularly fitting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming here uh, as ECB, obviously, but, but perhaps more as ECB as a researcher. So I think I'll be the first one in the conference today to, to say uh, that the disclaimer applies um, and that these views that I will express are mine, not necessarily those of my institution. They are not necessarily compatible with those of, of my institution, but they are, they are my views. And uh, the, the title of my talk will be The Euro's Global Role, Past, Present, and Future. And uh, having seen the, the talk of, of Kirsten, I'm very jealous about your title, which is so much more innovative than mine. I mean, I was very, very lazy in coming up with a title for that talk. And, and you will realize that, in fact, I'm actually more lazy than you think, because I copied it from, from a book that um, I had two years ago with, um, with, with Barry Eichengreen and a colleague of mine at the ECB, Martin was <coughs> kind enough to, to recall that I did a bit of research on that, on, that, on that topic, among others, and a lot of the things that I'm going to say uh, is basically drawn from, from, from the research that I've done <coughs> on the international of the euro and, and, and the role of currencies over the years. Um, so in preparing for, for, this, for, for, this, for, for this talk, I mean, I, I try to, to think of you know, what, what I could say about, about this topic, which is so wide that Cross, crosses across so many areas. And I won't be able to say in the, in the limited space of time that I have uh, all the things that I wanted to say, but, but I, I would say at least three things, which I think are important. The first thing that I, that, 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 that we say is that we try um, to put things in historical context. That's something that uh, Jean-Claude Trichet would have, uh, he left, but that, that, that he would like, like very much, because that's, that's, that's really, in my view, one of the most important things that you need to think of when, when, when you think about, uh, about the Euro's present and future. So, I put, I put some time to, to, to put things in historical context. Then the second thing that, I, that, I, that I'd like to, 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 to discuss with you is, is why it matters, after all, um, to, to speak about international um, currency status. Kirsten recall that for, for many, many years, leaders were just not interested in, in, in this topic, and all of a sudden, they woke up to, to, to a new reality. So what, what, what I do in, in, in that section is to, is to, to, to reflect on what we've learned, uh, in particular in theory, um, and um, what scholars have, have, have taught us over the last 20 years about international currency status. And if I have time, and I will um, look uh, with um, fearful eyes to my, to, to my chair, if I have time, I will try to speak about uh, what's next in the future. And, um, uh, and I conclude from there. So let me start with, with something which I think is extremely important, which is the, 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 the historical context. And, and let's put ourselves in the shoes of people, not 20 years ago, but exactly 23 years ago, so in 1997, uh, when discussions about the creation of, 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 of our single currency all of a sudden peaked uh, to the reality that the, the new currency would come about. 
Um, and when you look at the discussion, I mean, obviously, the, the single currency was created to address an internal challenge. This has been repeated many, many times throughout the day. It was, it was aiming at, um, let's say, crowning and, and completing the single market. But at least in some countries, and, and uh, I would argue, especially in my country, um, my home country, um, um, the creation of the euro was also motivated to address an external challenge. And, and, and one quote which I like uh, uh, to, to, to refer to in that context is the late pr President François Mitterrand, who um, in, the, um, uh, in the debate about the Maastricht Treaty used to um, uh, stress that the euro, or one of the key reasons to, 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 to have the euro is that it could be the strongest currency in the world and perhaps even stronger than the dollar. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic, you also had uh, a number of Euro enthusiasts. So Fred Birchton is, is, was back then widely known as, 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 as one of those. And he wrote a couple of pieces which uh, left quite some impression um, in, in this era. Where, where, for instance, he said that the dollar with the creation of the Euro would have its first real competitor since, um, since the dollar itself surpassed sterling uh, as the world's dominant currency. He even said, if I recall well, that, that, that the advent of the euro would be given the most remarkable historical achievement in the international monetary system since the collapse of Bretton Woods. Obviously, on, on, on the other side of the, uh, of the Atlantic, you also had a number of people who were skeptical. Martin Felstein, whose name was mentioned uh, uh, this morning, was one. And also Nobel Prize winner Nobel, no, uh, Nathan Friedman was, uh, was, uh, was uh, one of the skeptics, precisely because uh, one of the arguments why the euro was created in his view was not related to economics, but more to a political and international political pressure. So that's the, uh, let's say, historical context more than 20 years ago. Um, fast forward 10 years, and I guess that in this room, or, or certainly in other rooms in Europe, we were celebrating another anniversary, which was not in you at 20, but in you at 10. That was shortly before uh, the, the breakup of, of uh, the, the outbreak of the crisis. And <coughs> what, was, what was very interesting in when, when ten, 10 years ago is that the context was evidently very much different from the one that we, that we have today which is also a reminder that anything that, we, that we're going to say today may, in fact, in 10 years' time, look uh, completely, completely different and perhaps not, not well-rounded. So back 10 years ago, um, uh, people were looking at the data and what were they seeing? So you, you s you, they were seeing what you see on the um, left-hand uh, left, left chart, uh, which is a plot of the share of the euro in global foreign exchange reserves. And, and what, what, what they were seeing back then, just before the outbreak of the global financial crisis, was that in fact, the role of the euro by this metric was increasing uh, a lot. And you had uh, a number of economics uh, uh, in, 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 in those years, 10 years ago, which, which had come up with a number of studies. Men Zinchin from Wisconsin and Jeff Frankel from, from Harvard was, uh, were two of those economists. They, had, they, they wrote uh, in, in 2008 uh, a couple of papers which, 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 have become, which became famous in, in, in those years where, where they were projecting past trends. And what were, they see by, what were they seeing when they were projecting past trends? Well, they were seeing that uh, if past trends continue, the euro, conditional on some assumption, and here I must confess that I took the most heroic one, so conditional in that simulation that, that the UK would join uh, the euro area, but they had other simulations that, uh, you know, which were more conservative. So conditional on, on, on these two assumptions, proje projections of past trends, and the UK will join the euro area, well, the euro would, would, would surpass the dollar as an international reserve currency in 2020, so in two years' time, and in 2013, it would exceed the role of the dollar, but, but an enormous margin. Other simulations based on more conservative assumptions were you know, yielding the same qualitative trends. Now, fast forward another 10 years, and here we are. So the, on the left-hand side, now I complete the picture. The share of the UN global foreign exchange reserves has declined quite, quite, quite significantly, and we didn't have the UK joining. Obviously, we have Brexit. The fact that you had this decline in the share of the euro over the past 10 years is not a confined to um, the role of the euro in government foreign exchange reserve. It's, it's, it's something which is broader. And here I could not resist the temptation to, to put up for you an index of the euro's international role that, that we regularly compute uh, in our ECB um, uh, report on the euro's role, uh, which averages out a number of standard metrics on international usage. And, and we see a similar decline, uh, quite likely the one that we see in government foreign exchange reserves. What happened? Well, it's not too difficult to, to guess what happened. Uh, in between these, these 10 years, we had the global financial crisis, and evidently, this was not particularly um, uh, conducive to increasing the appeal, in the international appeal of our currency. Uh, one metric of that is, 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 is those two indices of financial integration that we had in the euro area. We had an increase in financial integration in the first 10 years, and then uh, financial fragmentation, which has weighed on the attractiveness uh, of our currency uh, internationally. Um, let's. Um, 
now have an assessment of where we stand. So we're in, we, we are 20 years after the start of EMU, and where do we stand? And one way to make this assessment, this, this assessment is as an economist, we use a uh, you know, typical method that we look at the cross-sectional evidence in terms of data, and also more importantly, I think, at the time series evidence. So looking at the cross-sectional evidence, that's, uh, this is a snapshot of the international monetary system, which has become a bit popular uh, in all the talks or, or uh, papers that you might have seen on that particular topic over the last six months or so, which is extracted from our report. So when you look at a number of dimensions in international currency usage, it's clear that the dollar reigns supreme. It accounts for 60% of any, um, uh, sort, you know, any, any dimension of international usage that you can think of. Then the euro comes second. Um, with shares in between 20, 30, or 40 percent, but you know something more like like like, like a quarter, and uh, euro is, is is clearly second with with some distance behind the dollar, but it's but it's well away any other currency. So basically, you have you have international monetary system cross sectionally, which is dominated by the dollar, with the euro distant uh, a second distant second, and then all the rest, including the by the way the RMB. So that's the cross sectional evidence. In terms of time series, um, I saw a chart by Martin Wolf th th this morning, which could go back to 1694. Uh, uh, we are more modest, we go back to 1899, but uh, I'm sure you, you may like this. And so I wanted to pay tribute to, 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 to your usage of uh, long-term historical data, which I think is exactly the right thing to do. Um, so, so, so with Barry, we, we, tr we, we try to reconstruct um, you know, data on, 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 on the shares of, of, of the major currency, global foreign exchange, so going back as far as we could, so back to the, back to the gold standard, when in fact, um, uh, some currencies were used on top of gold uh, to complement reserves, uh, including the, the French franc, the, 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 the German mark, and, and, uh, and other currencies. And if you look at, at, at this very long uh, um, um, uh, series of data, uh, you see that the euro, which is, on the, uh, which is this thick blue line towards the, the southern uh, right quadrant of the chart, uh, you see that in a way that the, the, the things which are extremely interesting, you see first that, as I was saying, the euro is clearly behind the, 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 the dollar, which is the yellow line. You also see that it's well ahead any of the currencies um, that we have today. So for instance, the yen, which is the blue line. You also see that, it's, that it has a share which is higher than any of the legacy currencies. So for instance, uh, the, uh, the German mark, which is, which is the green one. Uh, and, and you finally see that, uh, that, uh, that the share of the euro, by and large, is, uh, is now sort of what sterling share was before uh, the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. So how do we, what do we conclude from that? Well, we conclude that, uh, thinking about the debate which we had before the birth of the euro, we can conclude that the euro enthusiasts, which were predicting that the euro would actually surpass the dollar, were wrong. And that's, that's, that's undeniable. At the same time, those, the same euro enthusiasts who were saying that the advent of the euro would be the most important uh, event in, in, the story of the inter in the history of the international monetary system since the collapse of Bretton Woods were actually right. And I have to say that they were right uh, bearing in mind that we had an enormous existential crisis um, in, between, um, uh, in, in between the existence of the euro. So, so that's, that's something that, 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 that points to, let's say, a half, uh, half empty, half glass uh, type of story. Okay, so that was the first uh, uh, thing I wanted to talk about, the historical context. So now that we have this historical context in, in mind, why does it matter, after all, to, to talk about um, um, international currencies? And I would argue that over the last 20 years, we, we, we now understand much better why it matters. And there are many things that we have learned or that we've rediscovered or appreciate much more uh, in light of evidence that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that scholars have gathered for us. And I, would, I can't read you everything, but I will focus just on three dimensions which in my view are important. The first one will be that now we, un we understand better that we have global financial cycles and that the role of the dollar uh, is important in driving global financial cycle and, and as a result, global financial conditions. We now also understand better that, that, that uh, international currency pricing uh, is made mainly, mainly in the dollar and that this has important implication for, um, for, for pass-through or in international trade. And we finally learned, uh, and I would say we, we rediscovered um, perhaps over the last couple of years that geopolitics is, is an important dimension when you think about international currency usage. So let's start first with uh, global financial cycles. So, so, so we now know, uh, and, and we know, uh, I would say, um, better, since Ellen Ray's Jackson Hole lecture of 2013, that there is such a thing as a global financial cycle in um, global equity prices, global, uh, the prices of, 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 of other forms of securities, in, in, in global risk premium, and so on and so forth, um, which essentially is driven by US monetary policy, among other factors. 
And one way to see this global financial cycle is to look at the chart on the um, um, right-hand side that I put up for you, which is, again, taken from research that I done, and which is, again, a chart which goes back to, to the 19th century and which, which, which will appeal to, to, to those who like economic history like me. And what you see is that this is an index of global financial integration, which is essentially nothing else than um, an index of co-movements among equity markets um, globally. And you see that, that, that uh, in, the later, in, the, in the later part of the sample, so, so towards the 1990s and 2000 and 2010, uh, we have an extent of global financial integration which is as high as ever. And this, and this has not declined since the even after the global financial crisis. Now, what's important about this is that, that this is essentially driven by U.S. monetary policy. And the, and the reason why this is driven by U.S. monetary policy is, is also linked to the fact that the dollar is the, is the world's leading currency. So as a result, U.S. monetary policy fixes or determines monetary and financial conditions not only in the U.S., but also to a large extent uh, in the world. Uh, and and, and uh, an illustration of this, which, 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 which is easy to understand, is, is to look at the chart on the, on the, on the right-hand side, which is a chart that I took from Yun Shin, the, the BIS chief economist, which shows evidence of what he calls um, the risk-taking channel of U.S. monetary policy, or, or put it more, more simply, which is evidence that U.S. monetary policy drives international lending in dollars or drives global liquidity. Uh, in dollars. And you see indeed that there is a tight negative correlation between changes in the US dollar effective exchange rate, which is on the x-axis, and growth in uh, dollar cross-border lending. So in a way, when, when, when US monetary policy is eased, the dollar depreciates, and uh, lending, cross-border lending in dollars grows both for supply and, 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 and demand factors. That's the first thing that we've done. The second thing that we, that, that, that we learned is something that we knew a little bit in, back in 1999. I mean, if, if you look at the literature and even at the, at the policy uh, um, uh, literature, which was written in those years, you, you find traces of this. But thanks to the work of, of uh, the current IMF chief economist, Gita Gopinath, we understand this much, much better. So another thing which is important uh, when it comes to international currency studies is that it drives, uh, the, the, being the leading international currency uh, um, means that uh, your currency will be used disproportionately in international trade for invoicing, and this will have important implications for both global trade and exchange rate pass-through, which uh, exchange rate pass-through being something which is important for our central banks. So one way to see that, that, that um, being the, the, the main international currency, uh, currency of invoicing is important for exchange rate pass-through is to look at the chart on the uh, left-hand side, which shows you the, the degree of exchange rate pass-through to import prices um, in, um, in, in, in selected countries, Based, uh, calculated using different types of exchange rate. And what the chart shows essentially is that uh, pass-through of, uh, of, of exchange rates uh, depends very much, not so much, on uh, the exchange rate of your currency vis-a-vis -vis your trading partner, which is the uh, yellow line, but much more on the ex of, of your exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 uh, vis -vis the dollar, so which is the blue line. It's much more important. And the reason for that is that a large proportion of, 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 of goods which are traded internationally are just invoiced in the dollar. Um, another thing wi which, which is important uh, linked to, domi to, to dominant currency prices is that essentially, given that the dollar is the main leading international currency for invoicing, fluctuations in world trade would follow fluctuations in, fluctuations in the dollar. There is a tight, there's a tight causal relation between those two things. And in a way, I mean, th th this is taken from a, from a paper uh, from, from Gita Bokinat. So if you look at the chart on the, on the right hand side, you see that when there is, an, the, when there is a, the monetary policy shock in the US, a restrictive uh, monetary policy shock in the US, the dollar appreciates. And hence, the price of goods trading internationally becomes more expensive in home currency terms. And the result of that, um, global trade falls. So US monetary policy, via the role of the dollar, drives, to some extent, cycles in global trade. Now, this is not important only for the US and the dollar, but this is also important, this is actually also crucial uh, for the euro and the euro area. And uh, one piece of evidence of that is to look at this chart, which we did as part of an annual report uh, on the euro, which shows uh, which plots the degree of exchange rate pass-through in the long run uh, to import prices on the y-axis versus the, the extent of, of, of invoicing in the euro across a, across a bunch of euro area countries, which I put on the chart. And you see that there is a negative correlation uh, between those two things. So, so in a way, the, the, the more you move to the southeast corner, uh, southwest actually, southwest corner of the chart, the more countries invoice in the euro, the less is pass-through. And the economic reasoning, the reasoning mechanism behind it is very simple. The, the more the invoice in, in the dollar, the more the prices are sticking. The more the invoice in the euro, the more prices are sticking in the euro, and the more uh, those countries are immune to, to, to gyrations uh, in exchange rates to, 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 to foreign exchange disturbances, which is eminently important for monetary policy. 
the final thing that, that, that we've learned, uh, and, and Kirsten alluded to it, is, is that geopolitics matter. Um, and we know this since uh, the inauguration of President Trump and concerns that the US could weaponize uh, the dollar, some journalists have put it. Um, that's something which it seems to be new to economics, but if you talk to political scientists, in fact, it's almost a commonplace in the cliche, and, and, and many of them have written for years, if not decades, about those things. But what's interesting about this is that some economists have started to, s to, to look at the issue more seriously, and actually, personally, I've done some work with Barry on, on that thing. And uh, I put a couple of examples of, uh, of, of, of results that we, that we came up with, which we found interesting and striking. The first thing is extracted from a paper of ours where uh, we plotted the sh simply the share of the dollar in, in the effect reserve of, of, of just a handful of countries um, on the y-axis against the share of the US um, in those countries' trade. And what we found is that you had basically two groups of countries. You had the countries which are uh, on the um, upper side, upper quadrant of the chart, such as Germany or Taiwan, Japan, and Saudi Arabia. And then you have countries such as Russia or China, uh, also Switzerland, uh, which are on the south and uh, which are on the south south quadrant of the chart. And the interesting interesting thing is that those countries which are the north uh, quadrant of the chart, so those countries which hold this this proportion more dollars, are all countries which depend on the U.S. for their security, whereas those countries which uh, hold dollar less than predicted by their trade relations with the U.S. are all countries which are either um, nuclear uh, countries with nuclear weapons or countries which, which are neutral. Now, obviously, this lends support to the view that indeed geopolitics uh, is important and, and, and without uh, going into causality, I mean, you, you can think that, okay, the US provides security services which is paid for um, with um, an increase in use of its currency by the countries to which it provides security services. Now, we try to go w one step further uh, in, in, in trying to understand that, and, we, and we, we, we try to use some simulations, and this is the result uh, that we came up with for, um, in one of the exercises that we do, uh, which shows the predicted share of the dollar in, in the FX reserve country of selected countries based on two types of model. Um, one model uses um, um, only economic determinants, that's the yellow bar. Uh, the other model uses economic de determinants plus the fact that those countries have, have an alliance with the US which is the red bar, and what you see is that the red bar, unlike the yellow bar, is much closer to reality, which is the blue bar, than the model without economic determinants. So that again, to say that geopolitical factors are important in buttressing international currency status, and without venturing too much into territory which is you know, beyond the, the competence of central bankers, this probably tells you something uh, about the difference between the US and Europe and the euro area, um, the fact that the US is able to project its geopolitical influence better than Europe as a whole, and, to, and the ability of Europe to speak with wide voice, uh, may have <coughs> something to do with the relative status of, of, of their currencies. Okay, so I, I'm not too sure how much time I have left. Um, I have five minutes, so okay, that's an impossible task. So, so in, 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 in the, um, the few times that I have, I, mean, I wanted to think a bit about the future, and, 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 and one way to think about the future for me is always to turn to history and to look at the past. Um, so, um, uh, I think I'll skip the, 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 the first thing about policy that, 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 that we could discuss in the, in the, in the Q&A, or perhaps in other sessions. So, to the extent that, that, uh, that um, the role of the euro uh, declined because of the fault lines that appeared uh, in the construction of our monetary union, addressing those fault lines uh, might be a good place to start to, to, to enhance uh, the role of the euro, and, and, and evidently strengthening the resilience of the euro area uh, will be important to raise the, the Euro's global stage. That has to do uh, essentially with um, in completing EMU and, and, and the banking union. Um, to the extent that financial fragmentation was also not uh, very appealing to, 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 to the Euro's international profile, of course, moving ahead with CMU, with the capital markets union, will be, will, will be important. But one thing that, that bef before coming that I wanted to say is that, that there is, in fact, evidence from history that um, beyond the fact that, 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 that international currency is evidently and essentially a market-driven process, that, that right policies or well-targeted policies actually can work. And the best example for that is nothing else than, that the, dollar, than the dollar itself. Um, if you look at the chart on the, on the um, left-hand side, which plots the share of the, of the, of the dollar since uh, 1899 up to, 19, up to the Second World War, I mean, it's clear to see that the dollar played absolutely no role up to, up to the First World War. So obviously the First World War came, and, 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 which, and, and, and after that, the, the ascent of the dollar started. And it's not too difficult to think that the First World War actually was an essential contributor 
to the rise of the dollar as a, as a leading currency in those years. But they were, it, it was not only this. There is actually quantitative evidence that other um, um, ingredients were important, and those two ingredients were related to policy. One ingredient was the creation of the Fed, which was essential to stabilize uh, domestic uh, um, markets in the financial markets in the U.S. And the other ingredient was the lifting on the ban of foreign banks or U.S. foreign banks to, to branch abroad, to expand overseas. And it happens as those two things are happened in 1930, so they are confounded by the effect of the First World War. But r rightly identifying those effects, you find that in fact those, those things matter too. On the on the right hand side, I mean, I want I, I put a chart which, which actually shows that also the, the role of the Fed as a market maker in the in the market of U.S. debt securities. Uh, was actually also important in liquefying that market, in making it more liquid, and in, develop, in, in nurturing and developing it. And that's, that's, that's something which, which speaks to you know, our efforts to, 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 uh, to speak about a CMU. And another piece of evidence that, that financial decoupling, uh, which also has to do with CMU, matters is, is some work that I did with Barry on the, on, the, on the ascent of the dollar in the international debt securities market, so, so, so globally, uh, where we try to tease out and identify the, the, the various contributors to the ascent of the dollar uh, in, in that market, and what we find is that financial deepening of U.S. markets was, was perhaps the single most important uh, determinant quantitatively, so not only statistically in, in terms of significance, but also in, in, in terms of economic importance, uh, in um, leading to the ascent of the dollar and, 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 and eventually in, in helping the dollar be transferred against the main currency in that market. Okay, so I think I, I, I stop here. I, I have uh, two conclusions on the slide plus one that I will add. Um, the key takeaway is that the Euro's global role has been declining um, over the last 10 years, not least to, to, to market doubts about the resilience of the euro area. So that's a good place to start to, to, uh, to, um, to, to support that role would be to, to have sound macroeconomic policies, uh, deep, deeper economic, uh, deeper more economic and monetary and capital market union, uh, which will be key to, to, uh, to, uh, to the prospect of the euro. And the last conclusion is that history matters and you better look at it if you want to understand the future. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Arnaud. So we have now two, two very interesting presentations and we still have uh, time to discuss. So Kerstin, in her first presentation, made a strong case for seizing the opportunities to push for a globally more important role of the euro to reap all the benefits that come from it for European business and citizens. Arnaud gave us a very broad and also deep context and some outlook. So. Are there comments or questions? Martin, I start with you first, and then uh, the gentleman back here. So Martin Wolf goes first. Um, Martin Wolf from the FT. Um, I think you both sort of touched on this, but this is how I see this issue at the moment. Um, and it's very nice, all the pictures of how many people use the euro as against the dollar and so forth. But what interests me is power, real power. And uh, it seems to me now, because that's really what this was about. In fact, probably the only thing I agree with Marty on, uh, or maybe it was Milton, was that was what it was about. So it seems to me the recent events, notably over Iran's sanctions, and I've discussed this in Germany and with others, the key US power turns out to be the role of the US capital markets, their centrality to European financial institutions, and the impossibility of separating the European financial system's viability uh, globally from its ability to access and participate in dollar markets. Um, so my questions are, one, do you agree? with that perspective, and two, I have discussed this, do you think there is any plausible way, credible way, that uh, the Eurozone can reduce so drastically that vulnerability as to be able to conduct a separate foreign policy? Because my view at the moment is that Europe cannot, which is why it's significant. Uh, I take two more questions, so one was behind there, and then there is a gentleman in the back at the right, so we start here. I am Boris Boros, I'm Global Sovereign Advisors. Um, enjoyed the board presentations very much. 
it's uh, it's good to hear about multipolar world and uh, multi currencies. And my question is: European Union is has a big power, purchasing power. Why not price uh, oil uh, in euros? Uh, you would be able, uh, Saudis, of course, have to do whatever Americans tell them. But uh, you can demand that you want to pay for oil in euro. Or ruble, for that matter, or whatever. And you will get more, more interest in euro, in currency, you have the bigger volumes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. The third question was from him, so yeah. please. Uh, Graham Bishop, <clears throat> I just want to follow up on Martin Wolf's comment about power, political power. And the, the fact is that the weaponization of the dollar is not a new thing. If you go back to the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, um, friends of mine who've studied it, it's completely clear that it was a specific policy of US objective to kill the role of sterling and with it the power of the British Empire. Uh, now, of course, we're doing that ourselves quite happily uh, through, through Brexit, but that's a separate question. So if we, if we want to have that political power to ourselves and not be pushed around un unnecessarily by the US, we have to do something about it. And one of the things we need to do is think about how to compete with CLS Bank, which is the Foreign Exchange Clearing Bank, uh, which more than half all transactions not involving the dollars are still done in the US and therefore subject to US jurisdiction. That's where all these fines come from. We need to be able to rival that. And part of the need, uh, one of the things we need is a safe asset. And I'll talk about that tomorrow because I have some views on that. But the weaponization is not new. It's a very specific American policy which has worked dramatically well. I guess the questions were somehow directing both of you. So maybe Kirsten, mm -hmm. you will start to respond to these power issues. <laughs> and, uh, okay, on the power issue. Um, uh, INSEAD has this uh, interesting thing about red oceans and blue oceans. In red oceans, you have to kill the other one and then you take the part of the other one. Blue oceans is a system where your innovation, you see where I'm coming from, leads you actually to create a new ocean, a blue ocean. Um, and I think uh, it's not the paradigm of the red ocean that we're after, but the blue ocean, creating new opportunities in a multipolar world. Uh, the strength, the collective strength that we have, economic uh, and political, allows us to create uh, to create a new field uh, of influence and a new sphere of influence uh, more than we have today. You say we will never be able to speak with one voice. Maybe, but if we don't try, we will certainly not. And there's one photo, I mean, uh, of the whole Juncker Commission, uh, there's one photo I will always remember, which is the photo of all the uh, foreign affairs ministers, all the defense ministers, and all the chief of staff talking about a European defense fund and a better cooperation in the area of defense. Nobody would have thought that possible, such a photo, 10 years ago, and here we have it. It's a beginning, uh, and, and therefore I'm very confident that if we work together and we work on all the innovation strands uh, or all the uh, different strands to to present a better product uh, around the euro, we will be able to make strides. And uh, it's, it's not about defense, it's about seeking opportunities. I think that's how I would like uh, to summarize it. Could we regulate our way through it? Possibly, uh, like in the energy market. But what I said in the beginning, if you really want a very solid product, it's about capital, it's about trust capital and it's about political capital and uh, that is something uh, we have to build uh, together. We will look, and we had a consultation on the energy as well, on the energy sector and uh, we, will, uh, we will build on that in our, uh, in our communication or in the paper that we are bringing out in June. So the question is how far we can go but uh, let's wait, we have to do it and that's why we had the consultations, we have to do it with the markets. Uh, we cannot regulate only. Um, okay, so <coughs> let me take the, 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 the three questions in turn. I mean, uh, like let's start with Martin Wolf's correction. I mean, uh, I, I will really take my ECB hat uh, and throw it away and, and just talk to you uh, 
as a researcher uh, on that question, I, th I think you're asking the, the most important question. And when you said, um, you know, what's the root of power, the, 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 the role of the dollar, uh, the importance of US markets, uh, the centrality of the dollar, the role of you know, US payment system, um, I think we, we discovered, or, or we rediscovered, um, despite what the, uh, the gentleman was saying over there, how important those things are. And actually, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, one of the things I, I plan to do with Barry is to try and, 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 and tease out the respective importance of these, these four uh, ingredients and understand um, you know, which of these ingredients is the one that really matters to, to determine the influence. Um, but that, again, as, an, as, an, um, as a researcher. Um, now, y y y the corollary question that you had is, can Europe um, mitigate its vulnerability to, to, to further its, its um, foreign strategic um, goals. Uh, I don't want to answer about the, 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 the foreign policy aspects, but uh, Europe can certainly um, reduce its, its reliance and its exposure to, to, to the dollar simply by uh, buttressing, if it so decides, the, the role of the euro. And for this, I think I laid out what, in our view, the, the, the conditions are, are and, and what the feasible policy and, and, and desirable policies could be. S uh, you know, completing the, uh, the banking union, uh, the EMU, the banking union, the CMU, and having sound, sound policy looks to, to me as uh, something that, that, uh, that's important. So we can certainly support uh, those policies, which um, ultimately may have an impact on the role of the euro. So the, the policies are important, and, and, and they should be pursued in their own right. And ultimately, this may have an impact on the euro. OK. Um, there was a gentleman wh which had a question on, on where uh, Europe has a big power and why shouldn't, sh why shouldn't it decide to price all in the, in the euro? I think the commission had a recommendation on the, on the pricing of uh, energy in the euro, which came out on the 5th of December. I think the simple answer that, that, uh, to this is that we are not a planned economy. So, so the, the many of the, uh, most of those companies are, are, are in private hands, and they decide which currency to use, depending on a broad range of considerations. And if the environment is such that um, it's better to, 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 to work in the euro, uh, they will use the euro. But if, it's, if this environment is not, is not, is not fitting, then they, they won't do it. Turns out that I actually did some work with Barry also on that thing. And um, it's often said that uh, the, the oil market, because oil is an homogenous good, is the prime example of a market where uh, network externalities and economy of scale are such that it makes a lot of sense to just price in one currency, uh, which would be the prediction of a number of, of models, is in fact patently wrong when you look at, uh, at, uh, at the historical record. And it turns out that uh, after the Second World War and up until the 70s, uh, pricing of, of the oil market was, was, was done in, 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 in multiple currencies, mainly the dollar, obviously, but also sterling. And the key reason for that was that the, the main oil companies were both British, or British and Dutch for, for Shell, and American. So, it's, so even for, for goods as homogeneous as oil, um, you can have pricing in multiple currencies. Um, so, but that's a market equilibrium. It's a decision of people. It's not something that you can impose uh, on, um, on, uh, on companies. Uh, Graham Bishop had a question. I uh, actually had a question for you. Is, is the person that, that you talked to, is, is this Stephen Pickford? No, it's not him. OK, because um, that, uh, this gentleman actually contacted me ex with exactly the same, uh, the same remark to you. And uh, it reminded me that indeed uh, the, the IMF articles of agreement and the negotiation of the uh, of Bretton Woods uh, were apparently um, guided by, by geopolitical and strategic goals to diminish the, the, the status of, of the steel London and and, um, and, um, and and sterling, which I wasn't aware of. Um, now, as far as you can see, on payment system is concerned, I mean, it, it, it's interesting to notice that in the euro area, we are undertaking a number of initiatives to, 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 to complete and further the euro area payment system. For instance, uh, we, uh, we launched, uh, I think in November, um, um, TIPS, uh, which is an instant payment service. There are projects to, um, to um, merge target two settlements and, 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 and uh, T2S, so the, so the, the um, the, so, so a large real-time settlements and also the payments of securities so that would offer a platform to international investors with, uh, with money of, uh, of products. So there are a number of, of, of initiatives which are undertaken not to support the international of the euro, but, but in their own right. But as a byproduct, uh, if they make settlement and payment in the euro more attractive, mm -hmm. they, they will indirectly foster uh, the international of the euro. Which is a clear uh, illustration of why it's about creating opportunities 
rather than fighting something back. Um. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I have here a special screen, the chairman's screen, and, and screen on, on this screen I can see what you can see here, a clock. <laughs> and this clock tells me that we have exhausted the time allocation for this very interesting session and discussing these important questions that would clearly need much more time to go deeper into the issues. Let me thank you uh, both again for your excellent contributions and the audience for coming.